Mark Belliet will uh, kick off uh, the speeches from the, the table. He is the chairman of the Policy and Resources Committee for the City of London Corporation and has been an elected member there since 2002. Also deputy chairman of the City UK and the International Regulatory Strategy Group. Uh, thanks very much, Tim, and as you thank the city, I better follow the city tradition and thank you also for co-hosting today's event. I'm personally particularly pleased to be involved in our CPS study because 35 years ago I actually did a fair bit of work with Sir Keith Joseph and indeed it was great fun working with him. So what should the government do to promote economic growth in seven minutes? Um, a bit of a preamble then seven things one minute each. The government of course needs to on the whole create the right climate and then leave the market to get on with it and that's something I'm sure that people connected with the CPS would would agree with. So decisions, decisions need to be taken for the long term. But of course in politics one always has to do some things for the short term because you can't possibly have a major conference speech without an initiative. Uh, whether this be an old initiative relaunched or an initiative that's going to be announced again, you've got to have an initiative and one understands that and it's important that they don't get too much in the way of long term decisions and hopefully are of some benefit themselves in the short term. What business needs to grow is a predictable, stable environment as far as is possible with minimising uncertainty. So the seven points I want to run through are all very much connected with that. The first one is infrastructure. This is something that only the government can do. It is a government responsibility to provide the necessary infrastructure and governments collectively have failed to do that in Britain. They have done it very well in other countries. Airport capacity is rather important. We do not have enough of it in London and the policy of successive governments has rather been to um, hope that somebody else might take an unpopular decision. We need to get on with it. It is damaging to Britain now not having adequate airport capacity in London. The tube upgrade is very important to us in London as well and I think we're going to need Crossrail too pretty soon. So London is a thriving dynamic city with a rapidly growing population. That this is a great success sign that people want to be in London. That is far better than having people not wanting to be somewhere, but we need to provide the infrastructure. Second point is taxes. Yep, corporation tax is now at a competitive rate, and that is a good thing. Income tax at 45% is at a level that's no longer as damaging as it was when it was 50%, and I think people can live with that pretty well. We recently had um, some somewhat arbitrary attacks on companies who are deemed not to be paying a fair rate of corporation tax. We need to be very careful about this. Um, businesses should pay the tax that is due. If there's something wrong with the international arrangements for dealing with profit shifting, transfer pricing and so on, then that needs to be dealt with internationally. But we should be wary of simply picking on companies sometimes at random and attacking them. An area where we have a difference of view with the government is business visitors and visas. Indeed, almost every meeting I attend with business people says, what are we trying to do in stopping people wanting to come to London to do business? Our system is just not satisfactory. We are very successful in keeping out people we need in and not too successful at times of keeping people um, out that we don't want in. Our recent survey of business leaders suggested that 47% are dissatisfied with the current business visa arrangements and that is something that needs to be dealt with urgently. Uh, you've read about Chinese visitors. I read in the newspapers that something is going to happen. Um, it could have happened some time ago. We simply are losing out on a huge market. Um, third point, fourth point, European Union. Now this can get very emotive. There can be facts and there can be opinions. I am going to give you some facts about opinions, which is better than opinions about opinions, but not as good as facts about facts. So I hope you've all followed that. <laughs> First of all, the UK has much more influence in the European Union than we sometimes give credit for. Actually, on financial services, what has come out of the sausage machine is not too bad. What has gone into it quite often has been pretty awful, but by the time the UK has finished negotiating, on the whole, we've done rather well. The Bank of Bonus issue was an exception, but that was from the European Parliament. And to the extent that we don't do well, it's generally our fault, because we haven't engaged early enough or adequately enough. What city businesses tell us is that the single market is vital to them, absolutely vital. And I'm going to quote here some facts about opinions, not from us, but from the CBI. 
They've recently done a big survey of members. 65% said that if the UK left the European Union, it would have a negative impact on their business. 17% said it would have a positive impact. And for those who say, ah, that's big businesses, the small businesses, the figures were 70% and 12% respectively, so even stronger. When asked on the effect of EU membership of, on their business, 71% said it was positive and 13% said it was negative. One of the issues that concerns some people on Europe is immigration. Well, in terms of the ability to transfer staff across the European Union, 63% of businesses said this had a positive effect on them and 1% said it had a negative effect. So that's, sort of, that's some of the opinions that business leaders are expressing. And indeed, our own polling of city senior executives showed very similar figures. 69% said that leaving the European Union would have a, sorry, 69% said I think being in the European Union had a positive impact on their business. And the, there is some, now some uncertainty about Britain's position in the European Union. It's not significantly damaging, but at the margin it is affecting invest, investment decisions. And it's really important that we don't let it get much more than at the margin over the next few years. A critically important thing for the British government to do in the next year is to make sure the next European Commission is better than the last one. And that requires getting somebody in as the British Commissioner who's going to be able to have clout in the European Union. And it also means working with other national leaders, particularly Angela Merkel, to make sure that the right person gets in as President of the Commission and that the top jobs are filled by people who can do them competently. Um, a fifth area, employment skills. Um, we need to do more both in schools and for those who leave schools without the necessary skills to improve employment skills. A huge amount is being done in that respect, including by the city, working with other local authorities and with charities in London. And I've been at meetings at all three party conferences on this, and I hear exactly the same points being made at each party conference. So there's nothing, there's no difference between the parties on that. And finally, and very briefly, as we have Andrew who will speak far more effectively than me on this, is financial services reform. We need to complete it. We need to recognise that there are trade-offs in any decisions that are taken about financial regulation. And ideally, we need to be doing things at the international level. We've had a long period of dealing with the problems of the past. Um, the uh, report of Andrew's Commission was very helpful. We need to be getting near the end of it, getting a system in place, giving stability, getting the, the banks off the front page. That, I suspect, will take a couple of years. But when we do that, then the financial system will be far better able to promote economic growth. Chairman, that's my quick canter through what the government needs to be doing. Well, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, we'll be taking questions uh, from the floor the, after all four speakers have spoken. But next we have uh, Dr. Gerard Lyons. Gerard has been economic advisor to the Mayor of London since December last year, before which he was a leading city economist, uh, both at Standard Chartered and previously at the Swiss Bank Corporation. Gerard. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> The outcome for any economy depends on the interaction between the fundamentals, policy and confidence. The fundamentals in the UK are not great, but they are getting better. Uh, basically, we're past the worst. The economy is still weak, but it's still vulnerable to any external shocks. As a result, policy continues to have to provide a helping hand, but the policy shock absorber here in the UK, as in the States, is monetary policy. And as we saw last week in America, uh, the Americans, who were in the same position as the UK was six months ago, just as we're feeling upbeat now, they were really upbeat then, now they realise their economy still lacks momentum. The Fed realises that if it cuts, sorry, starts the time from too early, it could trigger a financial crisis again, and therefore they're basically having to keep interest rates as low as possible for as long as possible. We're going to have to do the same. The good thing is that confidence is starting to recover. The picture I'm going to paint tonight is a positive one, notwithstanding all the near-term vulnerabilities. And I'd briefly like to focus on three areas, global, the regional picture with respect to Europe, and then bring it back to the national picture. In terms of the global economy, the world economy is continuing to grow. We have a very divided world economy, East v. West, core of Europe v. the periphery, a very disconnected world economy, particularly in the West, where there are high rates of unemployment, particularly amongst the young. 
Even here in the UK, despite recovery, we almost have one million needs. People not in employment, education and training, aged less than 26 or so. And as a result, across the West, governments everywhere are playing to the gallery. We've seen that in the last three weeks with Claire denouncing school meals, even though um, it, basically poor people still had access to free school meals below the age of seven. Last week we saw uh, leaving the opposition playing to the gallery, and over this weekend we've seen the Prime Minister continue with an absolutely stupid economic policy of boosting the demand side of the housing market when the problem is on the supply side. But despite all that, we have to bear in mind that good economics is good politics, but good politics is not always good economics. The global economic cake is going to get bigger and bigger. The question is whether Britain's share of that is going to get bigger because of inspiration, or whether it's going to get bigger because of perspiration. Inspiration, if you came into the building today, there was two statues either side. On the right was James Jewell, we all did Jewell, said school, scientist. On the left-hand side was John Dalton, chemist. Um, if you were to put famous scientists in a building around here now, they're unlikely to be from the north of England or indeed from the UK. Uh, basically, the perspiration, the growth of the population is the key way in which we're continuing to expect to play our way in the world, with the UK population set on government projections to rise to about 84 million within four decades. The key issue, though, is the global economic cake is going to get bigger and bigger. Our slice of it may get smaller, but there will be more cake if we position ourselves properly. Second, with respect to Europe. The question is whether Europe is a castle or a prison. If it's a prison and regulations keep you trapped, then we don't want to be in it. If you think it's going to be a castle, a beacon of strength, and a multipolar world, then naturally we should be in. We should not kid ourselves that just because we say Europe needs to reform, that it will reform. Thankfully, Germany and Sweden, amongst others, are on our side. But if Europe doesn't reform, then we should be prepared to leave. And we shouldn't hide from the fact. Now, good news is that this party, Tory party, has committed itself to a referendum. I think if there is a yes vote in that referendum, it's as big a deal as if there is a no vote. We do not engage properly with Europe. We have a patronising, arrogant, aloof attitude that Europe does things and we basically then moan and complain. Basically, we need to engage properly if there is a yes vote. But if there is a no vote, then we should actually leave. I was heavily involved in the no campaign 15 years ago. I found out then that big business did not speak for UK business. Big business told us we must join the euro. It would be terrible if we didn't. We didn't join. It seemed to be okay to me. Ideally, it would be good if we were part of a reformed EU, but it's not clear to me that it will reform. The good news, if you want any, is that when the European Union did their analysis of European regions last, at the beginning of this year, three of the top ten were in Britain. Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxford, Surrey, East and West Sussex, and London. But that's very concentrated in the south of England, largely because those regions heavily depend on London. That leads on to the third part, what should we do? I agree very much with what has just been said by my co-speaker about the enabling environment. But also at the same time, I do think there is an important role for the public sector. The best thing that's happened in Britain in the last few years was the Olympics. Why? Basically because we had a clear strategy, we needed to deliver on the goal, and the public and the private sector worked together, and the private sector was enabled, and the public sector knew what needed to be done. At the moment, we have a policy where we seem to think that building houses is not the issue, but buying them is the solution. For the last 40 years, we've been obsessed with getting on the housing ladder. In Germany, house prices have not gone up for 12 years, and I don't see Germans complaining. Um, we have mobility, there is mobility in Germany. In the UK, we have more people migrating to London, both from the rest of Europe and from the rest of England but we can't basically provide houses for them as not quickly as the Mayor of London wants to build them. So we need to address that issue. We have a lack of investment. It's a lack of infrastructure spending. Alistair Darling cut infrastructure spending before he left. The present administration really hasn't addressed it. But today, the most important line in the Chancellor's speech, I thought, was the fact that he said the government would be committed to a budget surplus 
and in addition to that, infrastructure spending would grow at a greater pace than the economy, or at least as good a stronger pace as the economy uh, in future years, which would imply current spending, including welfare, would continue to be squeezed. But infrastructure is the key area. We also need to have an enabling environment, and the good news is that business overseas wants to invest in the UK. The question is why big companies here in the UK seem reluctant to do so. If I can link it in with the airport, what's interesting about the airport is not only that the UK government continues to drag its heels and at the moment seems biased towards Heathrow. But if you look at the estuary, what I find interesting is DP World, a Dubai-based company, took the initiative to spend £1.5 billion building a deep water port that a UK company didn't want to do, and the UK government didn't want to do. There's the ability to build a logistics hub in the east of London, given that 25% of our exports by value fly out of the country, are not shipped out of the country. But also at the same time, we need to be investing in infrastructure in many different other areas. And the supply side of the economy needs to be given a boost. But um, given the time, just let me finish by saying, the good news is that there are lots of positive things now being done. Lord Green is boosting the small, medium size, as well as big companies, export focus. Michael Fallon is boosting the whole supply side, particularly on micro in industries. And there is a commitment to continue to lower taxes and create the enabling environment that has already been mentioned. So bringing it all together, fundamentals of policy and confidence. Fundamentals are starting to turn around. We still have a long way to go. Policy, we need to gear it, move it away from monetary policy being the shock absorber to very much gear it round to improving the supply side of the economy and hopefully confidence amongst UK as well as international business in the UK will continue to improve. So in a nutshell, um, I'm very positive about the outlook for the world economy and I hope that the UK can grab as big a slice of that improving outlook as possible. Thank you. Gerard, thank you very much. And I should stress that Gerard was the number one forecaster globally, uh, ranked by Bloomberg out of over 360 people, so to hear such optimism is very encouraging. Um, next, uh, Fraser Nelson, uh, as you know, has been editor of The Spectator since 2009 and has a very important column every Friday in the Daily Telegraph and is also on the board of the Centre for Policy Studies. Well, we can kind of see the problem that we're dealing with. Uh, Anybody who sat through George Osborne's speech might have um, noticed some of it. Uh, his, the main part of that speech was that we are going to get back into the black, but by the end of the decade, by 2020, we're going to balance the books in um, I don't know, seven years' time. That seems rather a long time for a country that took six years to win the World War and is used to rather faster turnarounds than what we're getting um, at the moment. And the, um, it actually, uh, in the sort of post-briefing, which we journalists get after the speech, it got, from my point of view, even more depressing. Uh, it was reiterated that the Chancellor does not believe in tax cuts as something that stimulates growth. He believes them as a kind of, uh, sees them as a, a reward that should be given like chocolate to a good kid who's gone to bed on time after all of this is finally finished. The logic of that following through is that we can't expect um, much movement on taxation until the next decade. For those of us who intend to spend the rest of this decade living and working in Britain, that's not um, hugely optimistic. Now, um, what's the question about, of course, is what can he do? That's what we're here to discuss. And the clues to what he needs to get right lie in what he's already done. He's, worked, he's actually done some small reforms which have worked tremendously well. If I were George Osborne, I would simply build them a success, accelerate what he's doing, and be bolder than he's been so far. Now, take the cuts that there have been um, so far. I mean, not, not huge cuts, but in some departments, they've been pretty big. Um, we've seen the Home Office budget cuts quite significantly, and crime is down. We've seen the, um, um, the culture budget cut, and hardly anybody's noticed any difference there. In fact, our culture in this country has never been um, better. But it's actually, he's demonstrated something that the last government um, shown, which is that there is no real direct link between the amount of money you put into a public service and the outcome of that public service. If there was such a link, we'd be the best run country in the whole world after <laughs> Labour fed the government like a foie gras goose for 10 years flat. So it falls to reason that you can um, put the machine on a bit of a diet 
um, starve the beast a little bit, and the world will not fall apart at the seams. So George Osborne can do that um, a little bit more. Right now, I mean, there is, um, again, as we were told after the um, um, speech, uh, the average cuts in total state spending for the foreseeable future is going to be 0.5% a year, which is um, hardly a cut at all. Now, George Osborne has also cut the 52p tax. He's reduced it to 47p. And the CPS was lobbying for this for quite some time. It's not 45, it's because you know, there's two p extra national insurance. But when he cut that tax, the result was that the tax taken from the top 1%, the best paid 1% in the country, is now 30%, i.e. the top percentile pays for 30% of the income tax collected in Britain. Now, this is a figure that ought to warm the heart of the most ardent redistributionist. Um, it's the rich only collect of the 1%, only collect 18% of the salaries, pay 30% of the tax cut. Now, if that was to go down further, I believe that the share would increase more. So this is how to get the richest to pay their fair share. George Osborne has shown half of what we can do. The other half is what you wanted to do originally, take it right back down to 40, upon which point we'd be, um, I think, far better off. So you can do that. But the most important tax to cut is for the ones who need it most, the low paid. Right now, there is a cost of living crisis in Britain, as Labour correctly identified. And I think the response to this isn't to offer some complicated scheme whereby you might get your energy bills cut in a few years' time. What can be done is an emergency tax cut for the low paid. Um, the Swedes did this very successfully. And it wasn't a kind of pathetic tax cut, such as the increasing of the tax thresholds. You'll see in the conference one of the slogans is 25 million people lifted out of tax. Now, that sounds good, but what they don't tell you is the average value of that tax cut is £1.40 per week. It is almost negligible, easily taken away by the greater inflation which the government has tolerated. Now, what angers me about the, the Lib Dem idea of increasing the tax threshold is that it occupies a space where a proper tax cut ought to be, the sort of tax cut people would actually notice. Now, the Swedes, they wanted a tax cut, and the slogan was we are going to give you the equivalent to one month's salary extra a year. A pretty big, good proposition. As a result, the Swedish Conservatives were re-elected for the first time in their history. Now, the most important thing is that this induced so many people to work that the tax cut paid for it itself. I see no reason why this shouldn't happen in Britain. And I disagree with you with George Osborne that tax cuts blow holes in budgets. The right tax cuts can be self-financing as the more progressive countries in Europe are finding out. Now, this is dragging on because this pace of cuts is so slow. George Osborne is doing the right thing, but he's doing it at an agonizingly slow rate, like one of these slow Japanese course dances that you, you see, you're moving really like a microscope. You should be dancing to the speed of the music being played outside us right now. <laughs> and, and I'm always very happy when the Tories come to Manchester for their conference, because it was here in Manchester that the very basics, the very fundamentals of proper progressive capitalism were most successfully expounded. These guys around us right now, looking at the years, 1845, 1843, what brilliant times to be in Manchester at a time where intellectually it was leading not just Britain but most of the world in the liberal reforms that we had there. And the formula wasn't that difficult and is one we can use again. Low taxes, sound money, and regulatory restraint. It isn't that difficult. And if we had more of it, we could act this mess a lot quicker. Fraser, thank you very much indeed. Our final speaker is an old friend of the Centre for Policy Studies. Andrew Tarry is MP for Chichester since 1997 and has been chairman of the Treasury Select Committee since 2010. Um, I'm delighted to say that he also won a highly prestigious uh, award earlier this year, uh, the Think Tank Publication of the Year. Out of 2,000 think tank publications, Andrews was judged uh, uh, the winner his, for his work on uh, the uh, neither on the pamphlet neither just nor secure, which strongly criticised a uh, coalition uh, policy on, on uh, fighting terrorism. He was also, of course, the author of a fantastic pamphlet we published a couple of years ago, uh, which um, sold the headlines at, uh, at the last Manchester Conservative Party conference. In that pamphlet, he criticised the coalition economic policy as being neither inconsistent nor as being both inconsistent and incoherent. Have, have things changed? 
<laughs> well, um, thanks for the introduction. I, I mean, I really feel I would say something nice about the Kurdish <laughs> after an introduction like that. Um, I, I was actually going to say something reasonably nice, at least to start with. That I, I think the uh, you need three things to get growth. Uh, you need a macroeconomic framework that people believe in. Uh, you need a microeconomic framework, a policy for the supply side that is going to raise the long run growth rate, and you need all of that to be credible. You need credibility, not just market credibility, but trust and confidence in the business community. And talking about all that's quite easy, it's what I've just done. Doing it is another matter and is extremely difficult uh, and requires a hard grind over many years. On the macroeconomic side, I think the government has uh, done a good job, actually. I think the coalition, the Liberals have made a great contribution. Um, the macroeconomic, uh, uh, the attempt to demonstrate uh, a will to, to deal with the, uh, the deficit uh, has paid off. People now believe in it. And although the deficit uh, remains uh, too high, and the debt stock, of course, as well, uh, people believe that the government's taking the requisite action, the borrowing costs uh, are as a result considerably low. Policy has been much more flexible than is commonly supposed. The automatic stabilisers, as they're called, have been allowed to kick in uh, when, where growth rates did not match forecasts. And those are very large, as Paul Johnson and I had, we had an exchange of letters at the IFS. Paul Johnson, he's sitting in the audience this evening. Uh, he and I uh, concluded that this must be somewhere in the region of 100 billion to 200 billion. We didn't know exactly what the number is, but it's a very large injection that's come through from the automatic stabilizers over the period that they've been in operation. I'm quite cautious about arguing that we're really coming out of all these problems for good. Uh, we're still in the phase of rebuilding our savings as a nation. And when a nation is rebuilding its savings, uh, you will get below trade growth. So even if we may have a period of strong growth, we will also, unless we can get that long run growth up to compensate, we're going to find ourselves not doing quite as well as we'd like. A few words about microeconomic policy, about reform of the supply side. The government didn't have much of a strategy for that. And in fact, what it did have was an accumulated set of policies for an age which no longer exists, what I described two years ago in that pamphlet, an age of abundance, um, policies for very sharp increases in aid, heavy ring fencing of spending on a number of key areas, uh, very expensive pledges on carbon reduction, and uh, things like a happiness index, and so it goes on. A whole raft of ideas which I think are not particularly pertinent to the economic environment we're now living in. But the government's realised that and has, that's why I'm so supportive of what the government are doing at the moment, certainly by comparison with two years ago. In fact, the change of heart and tone seemed to come two years ago at that party conference where George Osborne, a week after we published, or fortnight after we published that paper, stood up and told the conference that we weren't going to carry on cutting carbon emissions in a way that left our industry worse off than that of other countries. And that point's been reiterated uh, only uh, this week, or last week, by David Cameron, uh, and is now certainly part of uh, the language of, uh, the, of the government. So what do we need to do now? Well, I don't think we can do a lot more at the tail end of a term of some of the radical reforms are so difficult. What we can do is set out what we will do as soon as we have an opportunity and a mandate as a party uh, that is no longer in coalition. On taxation, we need to make the case for lower taxes, lower tax rates with uh, fewer allowances. We need to, on competition policy, make a strong case for increasing competition a good deal, particularly, not only, but particularly in the financial sector. And there, the Treasury Committee, which I chair, and also the Banking Commission, which I chair, the joint commission of both Houses of Parliament, uh, they both came forward with strong recommendations to improve competition so that the mass of ordinary people can uh, have a better choice of the uh, bank account that they take out so that 
uh, we can get the regulators much more concerned about competition than they have been. The government are pushing through, or have been encouraged to push through now, reforms in the banking bill that's currently before Parliament, two important changes that will make competition an objective, both of the PRA, that's the uh, prudential regulator that now sits in the Bank of England, and in the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, that is the successor body for conduct issues to the Financial Services Authority. On energy, I think it, we just have to abandon this drive for uh, uh, uncompetitive energy sources such as wind farms. We can't carry on like this indefinitely, pouring money into technology that is so clearly not yet uh, cost effective. And we need a much more balanced approach both to energy costs and security, which will mean for, uh, taking advantage of other technologies. And you can see too that the government is moving in that direction. So that's very, very good news indeed. And that has a close link to another area that we need action on. I don't know whether this was mentioned from those who were speaking when one way or another on behalf of the city a moment ago. Um, we can't carry on like this with air transport in such a mess. We really have to have a third runway at Heathrow and I expect that's what the government will do. Um, I hope that they re-examine this decision. It looks as if they're going to. And we have to find ways of using capital spending to best effect in, in the, on the rail network. I don't know definitively what we should do, but I certainly think we need to re-examine very carefully the case for HS2 before we finally make that an irrevocable, pro an irrevocable project. It does sound to me highly plausible that we could get a better bang for our buck for rail users with that kind of money, or even a fraction of that kind of money, than, than the 50 billion it will cost to get a line up here convenient as it will be for Conservative Party conferences once every couple of years. Um, I just want to end with one, um, one point about where the Conservative Party positions itself. I don't often, not, able, not often able to talk just as a Conservative Party politician because I chair all party uh, committees, but I want to make one point about what I saw last week, and I hope my colleagues on the committee, the Labour colleagues, don't take this to a miss. I think a great opportunity has opened up for the Conservatives to fill the gap created by Labour a fortnight ago. They appear uh, to want to substitute markets with direct intervention and in major areas of economic activity. That sounds to me like the language of nationalisation, whether it's nationalisation by the front door or the back door. Uh, and it, it does seem to me it looks as if it would be, if implemented, a step on the road back to Clause 4, the decisive moment nearly 20 years ago when the uh, Labour Party it said, made itself electable. But we've got to respond to that by making clear that we want to make markets work better. We want to not say, OK, well, we'll find some halfway house with what they're proposing. We've got now to state the case for markets more strongly than ever. And, for example, we've got to use energy policy, the very area Labour chose to move away from a 20-year um, apparent reconciliation with markets to make our point. By mobilising markets and competition, we can bring uh, energy costs down. And we've only got to look at what's happened in the United States to see how much can be achieved, which will greatly increase business competitiveness. But most of all, we can make the moral case for markets, which seems so often not to be made anymore. The moral case for using markets to get energy prices down is overwhelming because it's the poorest who always end up paying uh, relatively the most when energy prices are high, not only in our own economy, but also globally. That is why it is so crucial uh, also that Britain does not get itself too deeply trapped in this crash program of carbon reduction, which if we persist with it, will end up impoverishing a generation of people who might otherwise have a hope of escaping from it in the uh, developing world. Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, questions, please. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Sarah. 
uh, Sandale from Money Marketing. Um, my question, I guess, is probably directed to Mark and Andrew, which is what can financial services regulators do to safely boost growth, whether it's dealing with the uh, capital Taliban or the retail distribution review? Um, what can we do? Um, I think you just go back to what I said earlier about um, you know, recognising trade-offs. Uh, there is a natural tendency on the part of all regulators to be overcautious. Regulators get severely criticised when institutions fail. Um, if institutions simply become uncompetitive, they are less criticised. Um, and so regu but regulators do need to, to do the trade-off, and Andrew made the valid point about having a, a competition objective. We can have very safe banks. The fewer banks we have, the safer, the, the less likely we will have a lot failing. Um, and if we require them to have massive amounts of capital, they're less likely to fail. But there is a cost in all of these things, and that cost needs to be assessed. And I think the worry of the financial services industry is that Often the analysis doesn't look at the totality of regulation. We have impact assessments that look at one thing but don't look at the whole lot. Um, uh, uh, Gerard talked a bit about housing, which was my old subject. I knew we had gone too far when I was told by my mortgage lender that I'm no longer credit worthy. Um, and that struck me that um, you know, either something's happened to me in my life, or alternatively perhaps we have gone a bit too far. But I do wonder, for example, how the government's policies on self-employment match up with their policies on encouraging people to own homes. Um, so it's just making sure that the trade-off is recognised, that there is nothing that simply is a win-win on regulation, um, and that the full costs of policies and the totality of policies is readily understood. I'm happy to say I'm a complete amateur on the RDR, I'm afraid it's... Um, Depends which one. Is this the Retail Distribution Review or Recovery and Resolution Directive? <laughs> first. The first one. I, I, sorry, I, that's out of my comfort zone. Well, I mean, all this stuff's out of my comfort zone, really, but, but I'll, I'll have a go anyway. Uh, I mean, on, on, on RDR, um, this is technical stuff, and it's not going to interest most of the people in the room, but to put it in a few sentences, we couldn't carry on with the Trail Commission disguised from customers as it had been, and the RDR proposal was pushed through in order to clear that up, and it was probably the right thing to do. It's having the unfortunate consequence, parts of RDR, uh, of consolidating the industry into a smaller number of large players that can be damaging to competition at the bottom end, and so that's got to be watched very carefully. The Treasury Committee proposed a pause on the road out of RDR in order to try and get this right. The government rejected that, but the regulator rejected that proposal. Uh, we are watching it. Uh, it's too early to tell whether, and if so, how much damage has been done, but we should keep an eye on it. The, the much bigger question you asked uh, was about what regulators can and should be doing. And the first thing they should be doing is looking at the big picture, trying to identify where the really big risks lie, rather than spending their time immersing themselves in heaps <coughs> of pointless detail. And, uh, and the flip side of that is they've got to keep out of mindless data collection and box ticking. Anybody who works in a bank or in a, in, a, in a firm that's regulated, heavily regulated, will tell you these guys come in and demand heaps of material. God alone knows what they do with it. It costs a packet to collect. The compliance cost is huge. What is the point of all this? They need to be looking at where do those risks really lie in an innovative way each time they come to examine that firm. The third thing I'd say, I mean, there's a, a whole report that we've published on this uh, subject. We, I can't remember how many pages it is, but you probably can. It's about 600 pages. That should keep you busy for a while. Uh, so I hope that uh, you'll, you won't feel that you've been shortchanged by the uh, Banking Commission, which I chaired. But in there, one of the many points that uh, we tried to make was if you want people to do the right thing, and not to end up putting excessive risk on their balance sheets, which can have systemic uh, importance. You've got to make sure that risk and reward are directly linked. If you can get bonuses in the short term for um, the, the uh, taking on of risks, which we only know in the long term whether they turn out to be a, a good risk or a bad risk, 
then you have a mismatch, a time mismatch between the risk and the reward for that firm, and you've got a problem. That's why some bonuses need to be paid out over a much longer time frame than they have been for the two. Not just bonuses, it's the remuneration package as a whole. Link risk and reward. For an entrepreneur, that happens automatically. He can't find some way of getting his money early. But in a bank uh, and in a, in a financial institution whose uh, very purpose is maturity transformation, time shifting the whole time, uh, it, it is much easier for management to find ways of achieving that. That's a task of regulators to keep an eye on, not an easy one, uh, but certainly a crucial uh, job of theirs. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, when the financial crisis hit five years ago, um, the three things that quickly materialised in the first few months as areas that we needed to focus on were exit strategies in the West in terms of monetary policy. Then central bankers all agreed that they would exit at the same time. Uh, but obviously recoveries are very different and exit strategies as we're seeing will be different. But the other two areas are very relevant for the UK as well. One was the scale of the shadow banking industry. And what we've seen is that um, as regulations have tightened, the incentives to go into the shadow banking industry have intensified. And the Financial Stability Board, which Mark Carney chairs, actually a few, about three or four weeks ago, came out with a 15-page report on the shadow banking industry, uh, told us it was bigger. Um, we weren't quite sure how much bigger, though. That's the challenge. And also, the other thing that lesson was how much of financial sector activity was intra the financial sector and to coin Lord Turner's phrase and how it was socially useless. Now, those lessons are still very relevant, but notwithstanding that, I think the great thing about five years ago was we found out that parts of the city did really well. And even though we say it was a financial crisis, what it really was was a banking crisis. And I think one of the positive things is how well many different parts of the city, asset management, insurance, Lloyds have had a great last few years. So uh, in the UK, it's very much about the city in terms of the banks. The challenge, though, is very much the one that Governor Mervyn King said. Uh, when you look at the size of the banking sector in the city in relation to the European economy, it's not that big. In relation to the UK economy, it's huge. And therefore, naturally, the regulatory pendulum has gone from too light over to the other side too heavy. And what we really need is somewhere in the middle. But in terms of the banks, we need to make sure it's pretty tough. I think Glass Steagall, even though many people say it didn't account for the crisis, it really fed many of the problems. We do need a ring fence. Governance is a big issue. And actually, uh, the Tory party, I think, faces a big challenge next year, because people in the city tell me the bonus round next year is going to be very, very good indeed. And that's going to bring all these issues back to the fore. But the positive thing to finish off on is that this government has actually done lots of positive things in terms of the Financial Policy Committee and the whole regulatory setup. And if the UK gets that right, then that should be a sort of force for good, even though not everyone in the city necessarily will like it to begin with. Thank you. Um, over there, and then Ryan, and then Mary Eddy. Hi, I'm I, Ryan Bourne, Centre for Policy Studies. I think Andrew Tyree in his uh, remarks made a key distinction, which many Conservative MPs often miss, which is that the Conservative Party should be pro-market, which is not necessarily the same thing as being pro-business, which seems to be the sort of default attitude. And I wondered on in that regard whether there's anything, anything in particular that policy-wise Conservatives could do, particularly in some of these industries where um, we, we strongly influence the cost of living, any sort of deregulatory measures or any sort of pro-competition measures they could um, uh, adopt in childcare or energy or, or these big industries. And, and secondly, um, everybody sort of mentioned macro and said the broad macro framework is fine, but I think Gerard touched on it. In the US, um, we really don't know how countries are going to be able to move out of QE or how easy it's going to be to reverse. I spoke to somebody recently in the US and asked him um, about monetary policy and he said, well, the thing is, nobody really understands how it works and nobody has any idea how this is going to end up. Are you confident that we can get out um, and reverse QE easily when the time permits it? Thank you. Andrew, do you want to take the first part of that question? Um, I don't mind either. I mean, just very quickly, um, on um, how we can introduce competition um, or get some more competition going uh, in 
various sectors. I touched on energy, and you also referred to energy. We're in very much competition in the energy market at the moment, but that's because the government's interfering with the market so much. It's not the fault necessarily of this coalition government. It's something that's an accumulation of interventions that's been going on for many years. And much of it in the name, as I say, of a crash program of carbon reduction, which is probably misplaced as an argument for reducing carbon, but not at the pace that we're undertaking at the moment. Does anybody really know what the full cost of the carbon subsidies is on the bottom line price of energy to the consumer? Or for that matter, the regulatory incentives and disincentives that have been put in place of various types of energy, one against another? Um, we just don't know enough about these numbers. Now, some numbers are published, they're uh, uh, guesswork. But the intervention at the moment is huge. One of the great success stories of the 1980s was the deregulation of the energy market, which reduced energy costs in the UK compared to our competitors and had a great deal to do with the um, dramatic improvement in performance of a wide chunk of energy intensive British industry uh, throughout the 1980s, which went, ran right through into the 1990s after the dip uh, with the recession. Um, your second question was how we go to unwind QE. Uh, that is a say is a big question, and it is a and it is a question which we have an inquiry uh, underway uh, on the Treasury Committee. We've already taken a lot of evidence on hours and hours of evidence and hundreds and hundreds of pages. And is anybody the first idea? And uh, <laughs> some people do have some ideas. Yes, I think in some cases they do. They don't have any ideas. Um, <laughs> But it is a big job to unwind QE, uh, and certainly any time soon, and no one's intending to do it soon. It's important to bear in mind that although the, the, the debt stock uh, is at historically high levels as a consequence of partly of QE, the, um, even so, it's still at relatively low levels compared to the levels that we had to cope with after the Second World War, for example. And at only at the levels that some of our competitors went into this crisis with. So we, uh, we do have some headroom, we're not right up against the, uh, the ceiling. I think what we've got to do is find a way of getting out of QE gently, carefully, um, finding a way of letting some debt run off. Uh, eventually, it will become a, a tool that sits alongside interest rates as a way of controlling uh, overall levels of credit in the economy. That is, it will be, we will think of it in the same way as we used to think of a policy called overfunding, for those of you who are technically minded. Um, the Bank of England doesn't like thinking about this too much, which is why we spend a lot of time asking them questions about it. And uh, in as much as they have thought about it, they like to keep what they've thought and written down and under lock and key in the Bank of England. It's our job to try and get it out there so that we can have a public debate about it. These are matters of public concern, and we'll be publishing a report on it probably next summer. Uh, Martin, uh, just quickly on uh, deregulation. Uh, every government that's come to power over the last, I don't know how many years, is committed to doing away with red tape. And we've had initiative after initiative and a general view of business is that regulation increases over time and it proving very difficult to remove regulation. Uh, and one reason is that actually people who are regulated often don't want regulation to be removed because it can be a barrier to entry to their competitors and all of the costs are sunk anyway. Um, this government has an initiative that I was a part of for a time through the Regulatory Policy Committee um, called One In One Out, which is now One In Two Out. But the problem with that policy is it exempts all regulators so it only covers government departments. Going back over the long term, the deregulation of the housing market was a huge success. Of, um, and I think it stimulated economic growth by facilitating the mobility of labour. Um, when I came to live in London, you didn't have the option of renting. You had to buy, and I think the option of renting has greatly helped. But that took a great many years of, you know, surreptitious deregulation in a way. Uh, can I point to areas at present where we could do some deregulation to help the economy? I've mentioned visas. For those of you that want a bit of fun, go onto the UK Border Agency website, pretend you're a Chinese businessman, and fill in the visa application form. And if you want a classic area where deregulation 
is needed, that is one of it. Um, and again, on visitors, you may have seen that Theresa May saying there might be some movement uh, over the weekend of something that would be a bit better. That's something that can be done immediately and would be very uh, useful in um, stimulating economic activity. Uh, thanks. Um, market failure, the monetary policy. Yeah, I reiterate uh, what's just been said about a uh, housing market yeah, in the 30s and the 60s. Um, there was deregulation, availability of finance as well, and that helped solve some of the problem. I think part of the problem is that if we take the last three conferences, it shows, in my view, democracy gives you accountability, but it doesn't necessarily give you responsibility. And the challenge in terms of the market is that when you go to a market solution, often you have losers as well as winners. And I think it was Ken Clark who famously said he was always in favor of tax reform until he found out it was sometimes losers and they made more noise than the winners. And the fact that when you move to a market mechanism, the losers usually shout and the winners keep quiet makes a big problem. In addition to housing, if you look at the public sector, while we have monetary policies a shock absorber, we had, in some respects, fiscal policies a shock amplifier because we've got three parts of it. We've got the ring-fenced area, we've got annual managed expenditure which depends on the economy, and then the other areas that are all being squeezed, and that's the shock amplifier. And in some respects, you need to get market solutions in all of those areas, um, whether it's policing or other things, things that are naturally important but seem likely to just continue to be squeezed without necessarily providing the outcome. But market, yes. Monetary policy, um, yeah. I think the challenge with the crisis, we had the lethal combination in countries like Britain, Spain, and America in particular, lethal combination of cheap money, leverage, and one-way expectations. What we now have is cheap money, leverage, and one-way expectations. Um, and that's why central bankers all know that they should be tightening as early as they can. But their fear, in my view, is that the downside risk, if you tighten too early, is that you trigger an adverse market reaction. And then you don't have any policy tools to get yourself out of thought to respond to that. So the natural bias has to be, for all of them, just to keep policy as accommodative as possible for as long as possible. And then they'll feel once the economy is stronger, once inflation has been let rip in asset prices, then, yeah, they'll get out of it quite easily. Because technically they can get out of it easily, but the timing is the key issue, and they'll naturally have to leave it later rather than sooner. Uh, but from here to there is the most interesting thing. Thank you. Uh, Larry Elliott. Yeah, and Andrew, uh, Larry Elliott of The Guardian. Uh, Andrew Tari mentioned that he thought a market solution was the best way of dealing with uh, energy bills. I wonder whether he'd extend the same principle to the housing market and whether he or any of the other members of the panel think that the right market solution to the problem of housing would be lower prices rather than solving a problem caused by excessive debt, even, as a, even more debt. I think um, that's, that's an excellent point. It's funny that last week we heard, you know, um, the left talking about the need to intervene in the um, energy market, now we have the right talking about the housing market. Clowns to the left to me, jokers to the right as they're singing outside. Um, but, um, and, and it makes us, uh, we sort of, you know, sort of free market conservative kind of stuck in the middle, really, because you um, do um, see that it, it's exactly the, um, right now, I think that the conservative government is becoming intoxicated with the same thing that Gordon Brown um, so mad. Here we, are, we can just unleash all this borrowed money. The house prices can go. People feel prosperity. Prosperity was the Teflon coating which protected new labour from all the things it was doing wrong. And right now, you can just see George Osborne in his speech today using it as a class weapon. You know, we're going to help the poor get on the housing ladder. Although I just spoke to a, I shan't name him, but a political editor of one of the national newspapers who's rushing down to get his help to buy a um, mortgage from the Chancellor to capitalise on his 20% um, free loan. You know? So let's not pretend there's anything um, redistributive about this uh, kind of thing. Um, but uh, I, I, I think it would be a lot better if the government were to get out of the housing market completely and focus. But I actually, although while I do agree with the undersupply, I, and you will know far more about this than me, Larry, but I can't work out why more people do point out that houses are so, the houses prices are so high right now because right now the banks Banks are lending at effectively sub-zero interest rates and real rates. 
I noticed the other day a strange, well, the crime was falling, I discussed earlier. One of the crimes that's fallen in Britain, most of all, is bank robberies. It's almost extinct now, it's a crime. And you understand, I, I started to wonder why this might be until I went into my local bank the other day and I saw them offering 2% mortgages, which is like, you know, they're paying me to lend. You don't need a gun nowadays. The bank will give you the money and it will pay you to take it. Now, to me, this is as crazy as any of the 110% mortgages we had in the bad old days. Uh, and I can't work out why more isn't made of this incredible, weird, kind of, here's the money, please take it, approach um, the banks have got right now to those with national credit. Well, uh, Fraser has said so many of those things, I dare not say myself, really. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, the crucial problem will be, in the medium term, under supply, that's got to be dealt with. Um, government has said that boosting demand will trigger supply. There, to my surprise, does seem to have been some, evidence, some preliminary evidence to support that. Um, we'll have to see. I've expressed my scepticism uh, about this already, uh, this whole area. Um, but um, rather than, um, um, how should I say, rather than um, Preempt any position that the Treasury Committee might decide to take at a subsequent time, uh, I will only make the general observation that in Britain most business cycles have been at the very least amplified, if not triggered, uh, by the awkward relationship between credit and the housing market, and we should tread extremely carefully in this area. You mean debt will tear us apart again? Um, what was that you said? I didn't quite catch it. I, I, I'm going to be very, very cautious about what I actually put on the record on this until the Treasury Committee's had a chance to um, In the previous life, I actually participated with the government in seeking to control house prices in the 1970s. It was a government policy that they would stop house prices rising by stopping people getting mortgages. And it was my job to implement it. So I, I actually implemented the rationing system for building societies. I issued them with a rationing book every month, telling them how much they could lend, and a side letter telling them how to get round the restrictions on how much they could lend. And, and what happened then was that because people couldn't borrow as much as they wanted from the building societies, they went to mum and dad, who took their money out of the building society and gave it to them. And one of the biggest mortgage, lend mortgage lenders today is the bank of mum and dad. Very advantageous terms. Generally, zero percent interest. Well, Osborne's not, giving them pretty good competition, yeah, though, isn't he? Really <laughs> There's not much hope of getting the money back. That's the um, the problem, um, and pretty pretty good forbearance arrangements. Um, and it really, you know, is very difficult to control. In terms of boosting, you know, boosting demand will increase supply. Um, I mean, sadly, and I'm very sad on some things, but I, I wrote papers on this 30 years ago, and I'm just trying to remember what it is. And the housing market is a bit like a sponge. You've got 100,000 new houses a year. It doesn't mean that 100,000 are sold every year. You can sell 300,000 new houses a year, even if 100,000, only 100,000 are built. And I see my accountant friend looking very puzzled in the front row. Because what happens from a starting point of a very depressed market is that when demand picks up, a lot of houses that have been on the stocks for some time are sold. They were previously unsold. So you can sell 50,000 that actually have been hanging around. You can sell this year's 100,000. And you can actually pre-sell most of next year's 100,000 as well. So you can actually sell an awful lot of more houses in a short term than can be built. So in the short term, a boost of demand will bring new houses out of the woodwork, but of course that runs out, and it runs out very quickly. And I agree with what Gerard said earlier. Um, the problem of rising prices needs to be dealt with on the supply side, not the demand side. Um, and the only way to deal with that is through planning permission. Um, it is no good exhorting builders to build more. Builders will build to make a profit. Yes, they have land banks, but the notion that they have what they call oven-ready land is just, on the whole, not correct. You know, they need a 10-year supply because some of the land has got no planning permission, some of the land they don't even own. You know, they need to put it together to get through the planning, um, you know, the, get planning permission and so on. And yes, they can boost demand, boost supply in the short term. But if we really want to double the supply of houses, we've got to have very different policy on planning permission. Um, yep, yeah, the UK in the last five, six, seven years has seen its biggest ever population increase, London included. 
think London is now um, 8.4 million, UK is 63.5 million. The government does actually have official projections for population. The ONS produces them. I can't remember them offhand. But I think the 40 year projection, medium projection, is for the UK population to go to 83 or 84 million. The other trajectory, when I looked at the assumptions about a year ago, seemed far more sensible, and that was 97 million. Um, so the, UK, uh, the positive about this is the UK will become the biggest population economy in Western Europe, which is good news. Um, but um, it does have a problem if we don't address the housing issue. Bob Rothall, the very well-known economist at Cambridge, he has sensibly argued that people in the UK kid themselves that rising house prices make themselves wealth, make them wealthier. And he says the only people who benefit are people who actually trade down. So he's worked it out that if you borrow, you pay off the interest, you then gear yourself up more to buy another property, you then do it again. The big gainer is the UK Treasury. Uh, if you look at the OECD data, the UK raises more tax out of its proportion GDP than any other Western economy from the housing market, partly because of stamp duty, partly because of inheritance tax. So you would argue um, maybe the government doesn't really have, any government doesn't have an incentive to change it. But really, it's not just house prices, it's rents. Rental rates in London are the big issue. Uh, you talk to young people in London, and they tell you, um, uh, they get their monthly pay, they go out, then they pay, when they pay their rent, they don't go out usually from when they've paid their rent until the next wage comes in. And it's a big intergenerational issue. And if this party thinks that what they saw last week from Labour about energy is an exception. Um, I think the Labour Party, if they decided to play the housing issue, um, they would really be pushing on an open door because there seemed to be a big intergenerational issue there. Uh, people in houses, average London house prices in the last year, and the market's only really got going, went up more than average wages, I think, in London in the last year. So we feed this idea you must be on the housing matter. And as I said in my talk, you go to Germany, a uh, great economy, uh, they don't think you drive an economy through rising house prices. Uh, we should be telling school leavers the way to make money in the UK is, gosh, should it be borrow, buy house price houses, gear up, buy more, rent them out? No. But we should be telling them innovate, go into science, go into education. But if you actually look at the data, We've skewed our economy so much to housing that we should not laugh at this. We think it's a jokey issue, but it's not a jokey issue at all. Right? How would, uh, you say Labour might explore it. How would an opportunity for the government explore uh, well, that advantage? Well, I think the, uh, the mansion tax it becomes probably one of the most popular taxes. We've lived um, doing that anyway. Yeah, but you start to tax right. housing in some way, shape and form even more. And you start to address the intergenerational issue even more. So you basically say, look, the oldies are very rich because they're rich in housing wealth. I mean, you, yeah, play, no, this, you yeah. play the intergenerational card yeah, rather than, for example, promise to bring back mortgage restrictions like you had to do in the old days. I mean, yeah, well, you see, the thing about mortgage restrictions, it comes back to a question Ryan asked about monetary policy as well. It, before Lawson, uh, or before 79, the mortgage queuing system was seen as a big problem. And it very much played to, if you're a working person, you're not allowed to borrow. And then credit controls, the same thing, get rid of credit controls, but the markets went from one extreme to the other. But yeah, coming back to your so question, I think it's the intergenerational curve. Thank you. We'll just take a couple more questions. Uh, Jeremy May, you would I wonder whether I could provoke uh, the panel into saying a bit more about the euro and its prospects, um, what probable outcomes are, what the economic and political risks associated with those outcomes, its continuing existing membership, etc. Euro. Um, I think it's worth the conference in itself. Uh, in I, mean, shakes, I, I mean, the jury is still out. I think on the euro, um, you know, it clearly has not worked in, remotely in the way that, that was hoped. Um, it's worked in some countries, not others. I think you'll find countries that think the euro has been very good for them. And I, one of them, actually, Montenegro, isn't even in the European Union. It's provided discipline. It's enabled reforms to happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. And although the euro has gone through a rather difficult couple of years, to say the least, Latvia is um, about to join, Lithuania, Poland is interested in joining. So they see merits 
in it because of the discipline it provides. It clearly has not worked in Greece and in Portugal and arguably Spain. Going forward, the euro may work. To work requires a banking union, and that requires a greater degree of political and fiscal harmonization among the euro countries. It is, in my view, clearly in Britain's interest that this happens, because having a weak euro area is not good for Britain in any respect. If the euro is successful and Britain is outside it, clearly as it's going to be, that has got some significant implications. I don't think we fully know what they are, and we need to be giving some long-term thought to what they are. And it's really important that we protect London's position, and I think that was done very well in the summit in December. Um, but there are those who would like administratively to um, require certain things to be done in Euroland. Uh, but as I've said, there's also the market factor of really what would a very successful Euroland look like for Britain. But we're not going to have to bother about that question, I suspect, for several years yet. And we can't rule out more Euro crises. That's very good. Yeah, well, I mentioned the Euro in my talk, so very quickly. I think part of the challenge I find is that here in the UK, we always look at this issue from an economic perspective. When you go to, quite frankly, anywhere on the continent, it's looked at from a political perspective. And therefore, the politics has to be the solution. In economic terms, there should be two-speed Euro, North versus South. But in political terms, it's how much closer on political union the continent wants to go. Yeah. Um, problems of the euro are largely unresolved. Um, as has just been said uh, by Mark, uh, in the long run, uh, a, uh, the euro will depend on um, the creation of a banking union. Do we believe that the German population will be prepared to provide um, deposit insurance to Greeks? Uh, that's the question. Uh, I think it's unlikely. Um, some backdoor route may be found to the propping up of Greek banks, which means that it's less visible for Germans. Um, but I, uh, that is the heart of the matter. Collapse, I agree with another point that's just been made, collapse of the Eurozone would be very bad news for us. Uh, we should not uh, engage in any sharp Freud or whatever. Um, the, uh, I would add one quite large rider to that though, which is that if I were a German and thinking rationally or a northern tier European, I'd be wondering whether we can't create some mechanism for the orderly withdrawal of those countries who find the discipline too tough for them. And I have argued for the best part of two years. In fact, I think I published another well, piece on this paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, that Greece should go. And I think that this would be good for the Eurozone, and a mechanism needs to be found to enable Greece to go. Um, I won't go into what that would involve, but I've given it a bit of thought. In fact, at the time that before the euro was even formed, I wrote a paper uh, on the subject of how to get out of a currency union because it struck me that before anybody considered getting in, this would be eventually a very important question. Um, without the capacity to eject or enable uh, miscreants or enable those who want to go to go without too much disorder, the eurozone is going to continue to throw up a great deal of monetary instability, both for its participants and those who trade with it. Um, I, I apologise to everyone in the audience who hasn't been able to ask a question, I think we do need to um, wind up. But I'd like, just like to ask a very brief question. I think there's been something close to 95% consensus on the panel that to encourage um, green shoots, we need sensible planning reform, sensible transport, policies, sensible infrastructure development, sensible immigration policies, and so on. So I think there is a consensus on what needs to be done. The question perhaps is, uh, is there the political will for it to be done? So one word answered? Um, yes, eventually. <laughs> uh, very difficult in, in so many areas. What needs to be done is obvious. I mean, immigration is one. You know, we just have difficulty understanding the current policy, well, business visas, immigration, as to why something which to us is so obviously harmful to Britain and has no effect on the number of people in the country, we can't seem able to change. But, um, low tax, more freedom, always works. <laughs> After an election, uh, 
uh, victory by the Conservatives. Ah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> thank you all very much for coming, and particularly thank you to the panel.